Welcome back to Unsolved No More, the channel where we hope every case that we preview is unsolved no more. Sometimes they are. Think about Brittany Drexel case, uh, Carrie Mae Parker, uh, Girl Scout murders. So there are some that are unsolved no more, which is I like. I and mean, there's a playlist with unsolved no more of all the ones that have been solved. So go look at that. A lot of playlists I created lately um, by individuals, by my cases, so go check out those playlists. I'm here with my Pete's Coffee who still hasn't sponsored me, but I'll keep repeating their name because it's such good coffee. Now let's get to today's case. Missing person, Josh Gooman. Hope I pronounced that right. I probably did not. I've seen this case recently when I watched the third installment of the new Netflix series, Unsolved Mysteries, which, in fact, I should be hosting. I would not be as good as Robert Stack, but I'd be better than Dennis Ferreira. That I am sure of. Regardless, we're going to talk about Josh's case. Now, this case is going to be something that I don't... Normally, it'll be different. And the reason it's going to be different is because, I'll tell you up front, I don't have a clue. But, we can make some reasonable assertions and eliminate some things based off of what I saw and the research that he did after I watched the show. Now, as always, we have to look at the victim. We have to look at Josh, and we have to see what type of person he was. Now, on the surface, everybody sees one thing. But everybody has something that not too many people, if anybody, knows about. And I think Josh certainly falls into that category. When I first researched the case, it was, hate to use the word apparent, but it was on my frontal lobe that he certainly just fell in the water. But isn't that an easy way out? Sure, it might be the most logical, maybe. The first thing that stood out to me, obviously, was when I retraced his walk home, uh, the body of water that he had to navigate. Now, for all of you that don't know the case, let me jump back a little bit. So Josh was a 20-year-old uh, student at St. John's University, an all-male school, and it was adjoined by a all-female school, and I forget the name of what that is. This is in uh, Minnesota. Josh was a political-type major law, lawyer, had aspirations, I think, for politics. Now, some of the people they interviewed said he would have been president of the United States. I think that's probably pushing it a little bit, but it's always good to have goals and aspirations. I don't know. I don't know the guy. But his friends uh, seem to think very highly of him. You go back even a little further to his high school days, and he was class president and um, voted most likely to succeed. Now, just off those little things, it tells you a lot about the kid. Um, not everything, for sure, but he obviously had his head screwed on right for those type of accolades. Now, not necessarily either. I mean, I was class president of uh, not my high school, I was finished in the bottom uh, 
the bottom third of my class in high school. But then I went on to college and I made the dean's list almost every year. So it just goes to show you, if you want to learn, you learn. I wanted to learn in college. In high school, I could care less. Um, but my point is, I was class president of my uh, police academy. And should I have been? I think they voted a little too soon. That's what I think. We voted for class president within the first uh, three weeks when I was... I was the uh, lieutenant in charge of everybody for the first two weeks, and I think that's because I had a Marine Corps background and I had college education. And so they put me in charge, and yeah, you know, it is what it is. But then they voted. Had they voted later on, I think maybe they would have chose somebody else who wasn't as uh, such a stickler as I was at that time. Uh, so it could be, what I'm trying to get at is it, it could be sometimes a uh, political type of decision, a fan favorite type of decision. It's not always based on merit. So, but it, it, he was certainly headed in the right direction. And uh, everyone that they talked to, Netflix, and the research I did spoke very, very highly of him. So what, let's just skip right forward to the night that he disappears. It's apparent that he goes to a party with his roommates, which is a three minute walk from his dorm room. His key card is used to go back into the dorm around 11.05, I want to say, something around that nature. And apparently, according to the roommates, it was to grab some beer. Or grab something, you know, and that's something else that you, you can't jump to conclusions and just say, hey, that's the reason he went back into the his dorm room. Maybe that's just what he told his roommates. You don't know what he went back in there to do. But regardless, he came back out fairly quick. They proceeded to this party, which had about 10 to 12 people. They were playing poker. He was drinking, of course. And at some point in time, before midnight... Around 11.45, no, yeah, something like that, he leaves. So he must not have been at that party very long. Now, he doesn't tell anybody he's leaving. <clears throat> and his friends say that that is unusual. Or at least one friend said that. Now, they would know. I used to do that all the time. I still do it occasionally when I go out, which is very rarely anymore. But when I did, I would say I'm going to the bathroom and I would just leave all the time. And my friends would say the next day or whatever, where'd you go? You didn't even say goodbye to anybody. I was notorious for that. And I don't know why. I have no idea why I did that. Um, maybe it's because I didn't like goodbyes. Even though I was going to see them the the next day or whatever. I, I, I don't know why I did that, but I used to do it all the time. So victimology would tell you whether Josh would do that. Some of the people at the party knew him. Some didn't know him, but at least one person said it seemed like he <clears throat> had to go somewhere, like he had to be somewhere. Now, I don't know how you can tell that if he doesn't say it. If he's continually looking at his watch, maybe. This was in 2002 when he disappeared, November 9th. So very cold weather, which is important, but he didn't have a cell phone, I'm assuming. Um, was he asking somebody what time it was? Did he have to meet somebody? Regardless, he left, and he didn't tell anybody. He has a three-minute walk, three walk back to his dorm. Yet his key card is never used to re-enter his building. Yet through research, I find, and by all intent and purposes, he never went back. That's the prevailing theory, is he never went back to his dorm. Yet through my research, I found that between 11.52 p.m. and 12.32, his computer was playing music. And not only was it playing music, it had forward, skip some songs, 
They were able to tell this later when they took his computer. That is extremely important, right? But let's say that that didn't happen. Let's say he never made it back there. And the next day he's reported missing. He didn't make it to his, I think it was a meeting for a mock trial. Again, he was practicing to be an attorney, which was out of character. And he's never found again. They bring bloodhound dogs in right away. Now, my dealings with bloodhounds is very minimal. Now, my dealing with dogs in general being drug dogs, cadaver dogs, is a lot. And I must say that I do not put a lot of stock into dogs. Now, I've seen drug dogs do amazing things, especially during training. During training, it seemed like they always hit. You know, I'd take a bag of Coke, I'd go bury it in a field out in the woods, 100 yards away, stand back, and the dog would find it. It was amazing. But in a real world setting, I never saw them perform that good. Drug dogs a little bit, cadaver dogs never. Now, I used a cadaver dog where a suspect took me and told me he buried a body and the cadaver dog hit there, we dug and there was no body. Now, it could indicate that the body was moved, but according to the uh, forensic anthropologists that were with me, before we even started digging, they said no, nothing has ever been here. Yet the cadaver dog alerted there. The hunt for the Zodiac Killer. When we took three different cadaver dogs to, where were we, Lake uh, Donner's Pass, an area up there. And the three dogs hit three separate times on the same location. That wasn't staged. That was real. And we dug and there was nothing there. So, now dog handlers will say, well, there was something there at some point in time, this and that. Regardless, I don't have a lot of faith. The Stephanie Coyle case, Bloodhound was brought in, tracked two different areas, two different ways. Nothing ever came of that, and I don't know whether they were right or they were wrong. Look at that Amber Alert just comes across on my phone. I'm going to have to take a gander at that quick, just in case. Got it. So, Bloodhounds, I, it is great that they brought them in so quickly. I think that was very good. So, the first set of Bloodhounds, now they brought in more than one, and it was, I think, months later, that maybe, that they brought in the second one. But the first one that the police brought in followed his scent from that party to a bridge over water. It's very easy to say that he fell in the water. We don't know his intoxication level. Now, some people at the party said he was, he, well, he wasn't stumbling down drunk. My question would be, well, why would he go off of that bridge for any reason? Well, when somebody's missing, you have to consider accidental death. Say he's hit by a car, uh, but his body more than likely would have been found. Two, suicide. Would he jump into the water? Well, what was the temperature on November 9th, 2002 in Minnesota? Was the water flowing or was it ice? What would be his reason to commit suicide? Well, sometimes people just, you know, you don't know what's going on inside them. So you have to look at that. Yet... Maybe his body would have been found had that been indicated, but anytime you're dealing with water, it's very, it's very tricky. Some bodies, I think of like the Anglin brothers and Frank Morris from Escape from Alcatraz, the video I did on that. Bodies never found. Well, maybe they're alive, maybe they're not. Uh... Ray Grecar, the Center County District Attorney, who disappeared. 
around a bridge and water. His laptop was found in there. And I will do a video on that at some point in time. Um, but bodies sometimes show up, sometimes they don't. But why would he exit the bridge? Well, maybe if he was drinking to go to the bathroom. But don't you think that if it was only a three minute walk, why pee out and walk down the bridge to go to the bathroom when you could hold it for three minutes and pee in your own comfort of your own house? And even if he did exit the bridge and go down towards the water to pee, sure, he could slip and fall in. But maybe he could get out quick. To make the, the leap that he just fell in the water and died is a leap that I don't think we should take. Now again, my thoughts on the bloodhounds are that it's just, I don't rely on them. Yet, they were brought in so quickly and they followed his path the way that he would take and they lost his scent on that bridge. I think that's the biggest clue that we have. Now again, when police went the following day to do a cursory search, and by that I mean they don't, they don't know that they have this big missing persons case. They just have a guy that hasn't showed up. That's, that's not a big deal, okay, to be missing for one day or the morning, the next morning. You have no idea if he hooked up with a girl, spent the night at her place, um, got too drunk, decided to stay somewhere. You don't know. The poss there's a lot of possibilities there. And foul play, suicide, missing person is at the bottom, bottom end of that. So you can't fault police for that. Now, once the days start turning into weeks, well, yeah, you certainly, you better ramp it up. You better ramp it up within the first uh, 24 hours. If he ain't home in the morning, afternoon time frame, the next day, okay. Once he misses that mock trial, okay. It is ramped up to the ump degree. So the cursory search by the police in the student's apartment shows that I'd want to know more of what was found there. I heard his wallet was found there. That bothers me because he shouldn't he have his wallet with him. If he's going to play poker, if he's going out. His contact case was there and it was open. So he had his contacts in. I think, I think you can rule out certainly that he ran away. Okay? That's one possibility that we could scratch off. The second one... I think, although it's still a possibility, I don't think it's probable, you can rule out suicide. The problem with suicide is you can never completely rule it out because you don't know what's going on inside someone's head. Yet, I think you can rule it out because I believe a body would be found. Now, there's nothing to say that he didn't just, he, he jumped off the bridge to commit suicide, right? Yet, I think that is very low probability. Certainly, you have to consider it a possibility, but it's very low probability. Now, what's that leave us? That leaves us an accidental death. That leaves us a homicide. Now, I am not one to make the leap to homicide in all these missing person cases. I think of Mara Murray. I don't believe that's a homicide. Um, there was another one where a guy, and my apologies for not knowing the name of this, but it just came to me, where he made a phone call to his brother and said he ran out of gas, and maybe he was talking a little incoherent or something, and... Then he disappeared. And they didn't... Everyone said, oh, he was picked up by a serial killer. That bothers me so much. And here, I don't know, 10, 20 years later, whatever it was, they found his body and his bones within five miles of that car. 
and that's what's going to happen in this Mara Murray case. They're going to find her body out in the woods. Uh, that's my opinion. Not everything is foul play. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yet, you have to look at some of the activity that happened with Josh's computer. And not just the music playing. At some point in time, after Josh went missing, someone went in there and washed his computer, meaning they got rid of, tried to get rid of the hard drive, at least deleted all the temporary files and all this stuff. The police, when they got Josh's computer, was able to recover a lot of things. And what they recovered was very shocking. And again, it goes to skeletons in people's closet. Josh had a Yahoo personal account set up where he was pretending to be a woman. And he had, I think, three different usernames. And he was getting messages back and he was getting photographs from men. Now... The way the Netflix series played out, it is almost as if they were trying not to spin a narrative, but they were trying not to say that Josh maybe was gearing towards homosexuality. That's what it appeared to me. Or maybe he was exploring his sexuality. Now, he had a girlfriend, but Netflix made it... Again, made it appear that he had his girlfriend during the time of the disappearance when, in fact, they had broken up months previous to this. They had dated all the way through high school and through the first couple of years through college, but they had recently split up. Now, that really piqued my interest because then they went on to talk about Josh's roommate, and I believe his name was Nick. And how Nick wanted to date this girl who was Josh's girlfriend for a long period of time. And when they interviewed another one of Josh's roommates, they had said that there was an argument that night about the girlfriend. Now, that is certainly something as an investigator you better key in on. Okay. Now, Nick was, was interviewed throughout the Unsolved Mysteries, and he put forth that he was Josh's best friend, and I do not dispute that. Now, other people, you know, friends and stuff, they would know that. But if they lived together in a in college dorm room and stuff, I would say that he's probably telling the truth. Now, he certainly came off as if, he had nothing to hide, yet he refused to take a polygraph. That reminded me of the Brian Schaefer case and the best friend there, Clint. It also reminded me of the Ray Rivera case, where his best friend, employer, refused to talk to police as well. Now see, that just bothers me. It might not bother other people. No, I don't believe in polygraphs. You know this about, about me. But it's like I want to do everything that I want to do to help solve the case. And if me taking a polygraph is going to help you move on to the right person, sign me up 20 times. But other people don't have that view. Now, this guy, Nick, explained, well, they're not admissible in the court of law and this and that. That rubbed me the wrong way. Right or wrong or indifferent. What also rubbed me the wrong way was there was an obvious time gap difference between what the girlfriend had said and what Nick had said. So where was Nick at? When Josh went to this party, Nick went to the girlfriend's house the ex-girlfriend of Josh. And I believe her name was Katie. And hung out there. Well, that bothered me a little bit too. 
See, because I'm trying to tie everything together, and that's what you want to do as an investigator. When you have leads, you want the leads to intersect with something and not just keep going off into the wilderness. So when I hear that there was a fight that night, not just a fight between Nick and Josh, but what it was about, Katie. And then Nick going to Katie's. And then the discrepancy in their timeline when Katie says, hey, Nick left at such and such time, 1 a.m. Well, Nick's key card shows that he comes into the apartment at, say, 2.30 a.m. But Nick says, no, I left at 2. I got home at 2.30 Whatever, the time might not be right, but the important thing is the discrepancy. In Katie's timeline of when Nick leaves, he has about an hour, an hour and a half of unaccounted for time. So, all those roads are intersecting somewhere, if you know what I mean. I'm not saying Nick is involved. I'm not saying that in the least. Yet, it is something that certainly has to be looked into because then, when you're talking about intersecting leads, everything is intersecting there. And then we look at Josh's computer being washed. Who has access to Josh's computer? Well, his roommates. They're the only ones. So it kind of narrows down the pool of who did it. You certainly want to see, or I, I say to myself, the missing person themselves, Josh, has every reason to delete what's on that computer, right? Because it's embarrassing. He's pretending to be a woman. He's getting these photographs. Maybe he's planning to meet some of these people. But when we rule him out, which I think we can because we already ruled out that he didn't just run away. Somebody else washed that computer. Now, maybe they did it because they knew what was on there and they didn't want it to hurt Josh's reputation. Or they were in on it. Maybe they thought it was funny to make up these screen names and to lure men to a certain place and then laugh it off like it's a joke. And maybe one of those people was meeting Josh that night and they came across him walking across the bridge and that's where his trail ended because he got into a car. Could be that simple or that complicated. The... Other prevailing theory is that he was researching and he was very upset about a sexual abuse scandal that was going on at St. John's with some of the monks that worked there. And in fact, uh, had done some research or something. And then bloodhounds brought in by the family, and I don't know the time frame, whether it was weeks or months later, followed Bron Josh's scent to... This place of worship where the monks work. And actually went inside uh, after being refused entry. The police were called and then eventually the dog alerted inside the building. Again, I don't put a lot of stock into the bloodhounds. Especially that many weeks later. John, if he was targeted because he was doing research and was going to expose these monks or whatever, I think there would have been about 500 more people that went missing in that area because newspapers were writing about it. There were other students that were doing research papers on it. Why target single him out? That theory doesn't make sense to me. Now, conspiracy theorists will jump all over that theory. Yet... I, I, there's no evidence of that. And that's the thing with this case. 
there is no physical evidence. And when you have no physical evidence, all you're left with is theories, no matter how crazy they are. Now, I certainly stay away from the crazy ones, and I use the art of deduction in order to get to where I need. Like I said, I can't rule out suicide. I can't rule out accidental death. There's no, it, it was, what, what day was it? Was it a Saturday night? Um, after midnight, around midnight, a lot of drinking happening, bad roads, bad weather. Who's to say he's not crossing the road and gets hit by a car and they were drunk. So they throw him in the car, take him somewhere else, dump the body. However unlikely that is, it is still certainly a possibility, maybe not a probability. So you have suicide, you have accident, certainly have homicide, you have to, but there's no evidence, there's zero evidence of a homicide. Just like there's zero evidence of suicide or accidental, but you have to entertain that idea, certainly. And for him to be a runaway. There is, you know, the, when I sit here and think about it, there is more evidence that he's a runaway, that he just left, than there is of any of the other prevailing theories. Right? Because his computer was washed. Somebody was playing music at about the same time it would have taken him to get home on that computer. Right? So then you think, well, his key card, he has to use that to get in, and it showed that he didn't make it back. Well, what if somebody was coming out? He didn't have to use the key card. They open the door at the same time. He, that happens all the time. He goes in, gets on his computer, plays some music, goes to his Yahoo chat. Hey, I'm going to meet this person. Before I leave, you know, maybe I'll wash it so nobody sees who I'm meeting. Leaves back out. He doesn't have to use the key card to leave. He goes and meets somebody, and then it turns homicidal. That is certainly a good theory to work off of. And I think that that is, to me, probably the most likely. Now the only thing that throws that theory off is if because the bloodhound stopped on that bridge. You think it would have followed well and then I think of this. I was just going to say the bloodhounds would have continued on to his dorm room right had he not got picking up on the bridge. Yet, isn't that bloodhound going to hit on the scent of him leaving to go to the party as well? So that bloodhound should have continued on to the dorm. That's why I just don't believe in bloodhounds. I know they're amazing animals. But he had left his dorm to go to the party. So if you are tracking the bloodhound from the party to wherever Josh went, wouldn't, you go, wouldn't it take you back to the dorm? Because that's where he, it originated from. Just an hour earlier. So the more I think about it, I think it is more probable that he made it, he left that party and made it back to his dorm room. And got let in and he didn't have to use his key card he listened to music for what 40 minutes while he's doing whatever he is on that Yahoo chat thing decides to meet with somebody maybe he has enough liquid courage in him that this time he's gonna go through with it where the previous times he didn't um, and you know what? 
I'm going to meet it. And if he is a homosexual, maybe it's like uh, he's, he's getting catfished. You know, where he, the guy that he meets thinks it's going to be a girl. And it's actually a guy and the guy freaks out. Would that give him enough rage to kill somebody? Certainly. But isn't it also more likely than not, I, I know if it, I put myself in the shoes, if I pulled up expecting to see a, a blonde 34C, uh, you know, good looking girl that I'm supposed to meet at 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning, and I pull up and it's a dude, I'm not going to get out of the car and, and beat his ass. I'm not going to kill him. I'm just going to keep driving. That's me. Other people would handle it differently. What if he was meeting a guy and the guy knew that it was a consensual thing? But then something bad happened. It's, it's very possible. It would explain. It, it, to me, it all lines up with him leaving that party. The music being played on his computer between 11.52 and 12.32. The washing of his computer. Because he's actually going through with meeting somebody. They sent him a picture, whatever it is. Hey, you want to hook up tonight? Yep. He washes it so nobody can see it. And then goes and meets and ultimately foul play happens. That makes sense to me. Okay. The roommate doing something to him, not taking a polygraph. Yeah, all those raise red flags to me, but... It, I don't believe that the roommate had anything to do with it. Although he has great, great motive. You know, hormones at that age. Another girl involved that he liked. Minimizing in that interview that I saw about his feelings for her. The time gap. Great, great motivation. And I wouldn't rule it out completely. But the scenario that I presented about him making it back to the dorm room, fits all this circumstantial evidence that I see is there. Now, I said I wasn't going to come to a theory, and I didn't have a working theory when I started this video. I was going to say, hey, there's no evidence to anything. I don't know what happened, and I still don't know. Yet, the more I talk through it, the more I look at the times... To me, I mean, that is something that has to be looked at. Okay? He leaves his dorm room with his roommates, goes to this party. He's drinking, playing poker, having a good time. He's intoxicated. He's buzzed, but he's not falling down drunk. And he says, you know what? I'm just going home. Maybe that's why he didn't tell anybody he was leaving. Because he wanted to be undisturbed. He, would, he didn't know he was meeting somebody. He was going to go get back on that Yahoo chat personal messenger. And he, he didn't want to be disturbed. Good time to do it when his roommates are out, right? So he walks by himself, goes back home, doesn't key back in because somebody's coming out at the same time. Now, why didn't that person come forward? Who knows? He goes in, sits down on his computers, listening to music, Starts hooking up with somebody from that personal chat. Before he leaves, he washes his computer because maybe his roommates have access to that computer. He washes it. Goes out and meets one of these probable males from the chat. And something bad happened. That's the theory that I'm sticking with until there's other evidence that comes forward that shows me that I'm wrong. Uh, if there was a date 
that the computer was washed. I would like to know that. Um, again, because that would go back to Josh not doing it himself. All they said it was done sometime after he disappeared. Well, I would like to know when that was. So it's possible that Josh didn't do that. Maybe the roommate came in because, like I said, the roommates were in on it. Did the computer have a password? Um, was it a communal computer? Did everyone have their own? Things like that. I would, I certainly would want to know, and I bet the police know. Uh, it seems like the police were on top of this. Now, one of the attorneys for the family, I think, does not believe the police did a good job because I read something where they released, the police released photographs of men from that personal site that Josh had contact with wanting to identify him. And I think that's a great start. But the attorney was like, well, no, you, why are they releasing that now? They've had that for all these years. Oh, wait, because Unsolved Mysteries is doing an episode. A very condescending remark. Um, but, so it shows me that the lawyer is not on board with the police. And it seems like maybe the family isn't either, at least the dad. And uh, I felt very, 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 very sorry for the dad. And... I liked him right away, like somebody that I could definitely get along with. Um, but that's what I think. Right off the cuff for the Josh Goyman and uh, Case, my condolences to everybody, especially the family members and friends of Josh. It's a terrible loss. It's been 20 years, and I can't. I would only be uh, blowing smoke up your ass if I said I completely understand, because I don't. And people that say I understand when they've lost somebody, uh, especially a child, you don't. You don't. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So, hey, until next time, thanks for watching this episode, and hopefully Josh's case will become unsolved no more. Rain's out. Thank you.